Uh, okay. Um, so, can you hear me, Al? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Got one yes. <laughs> My volume here a bit. Um, all right. Well, so, I mean, as usual, you know, people that are here, if you have questions you want to get started with, let me know. I'm getting a couple questions on the, the second assignment, so probably I was going to go over that first. We'll see how the, uh, how the uh, bandwidth is today here, but I can maybe go over that more than once if we need to, but, um, but uh, yeah, I was gonna do that and then maybe see if people had questions about last week's um, materials or this week's that hopefully everybody's working on. Oh yeah, and I guess, um, I don't know if, if well, um, unless somebody asked a question about assignment one, I probably won't go back to that. Um, um, I did kind of make some comments on that just in a standalone video, but, uh, but yeah, feel free if you did want to ask some questions about it to go ahead. So I know, um, and uh, yeah, we've only got a few people here at the moment, but um, the originally I had a mistake on this notebook. Uh, well, of course, first of all, I mean, I'm, I, I'm encouraging everybody to make certain you've got the right stuff here and definitely don't work too far ahead because I'm probably gonna be completely changing at least the next two assignments, if not all the rest of these. So, so um, but yeah, you should make certain that you're that you did a git poll um, relatively recently here, and that your second assignment is named Assignment Two: Scikit Learn Stats Model Exercises, um, and that if you open it up, it has the due date of nine eighteen. Then you probably have got the correct one, um, and if if that's not what you're seeing, uh, then you need to do a git poll. So. Um, so it should be due by 5 p.m. So if I've got it wrong, do I have it wrong in the class or something? So, so somebody's asking about the due date and time on the uh, second assignment. Yeah, I'm at 5 p.m. on that, so. Uh, well, let me, just give me a second. I'm going to fix that one thing about it. Uh, oh, I know why I'm wrong. <laughs> I should be better. Um, yeah, so it just should be 5 p.m. Um, on Friday here, so there you go. I should be better. Yeah, we'll see. I'll hope, hopefully everybody can get it here by Friday. I, I don't know if, um, if this little assignment will take as much time as the first one. I don't think it will, but we'll, we'll see what people tell me. So, But yeah, I kind of wanted it by five just so I can um, check. And if I have to, you know, send a quick email, do a quick check that people submitted the right file and that they submitted it and that they submitted something and, uh, um, and uh, give them a heads up uh, on on Friday, so. All right, oh, I'm sorry, um, I need to pause for just one second. I'll be right back.
Okay, sorry about that. Somebody was knocking at the door. <laughs> okay, the, 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 the things about uh, doing stuff at home here. So, can people still hear me, hear me now? I'll start again here. Yes. All right, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, all right. So yeah, like I was saying, um, I've had uh, people working on assignment two, um, which is good. Um, so make sure you do have the right one and probably don't get too far out. Try to get the assignment three. It's gonna be a different assignment three. I'll try to get that up before uh, Friday, before you guys are done with the assignment two. But um, but yeah, you shouldn't be looking at that one yet. Uh, so it'll, it'll be a different one on there. The other thing is, is there was a mistake in here, although I did fix it, but uh, if you did a git poll, um, before I pushed out a fix. Uh, so, so the, the two files, the first one should be assignment two profit data .csv, uh, which you should be able to find in the, uh, the data there. Uh, so, so yeah, this profit data is the one for the regression. Uh, and then the other one I think I had, I had the wrong name for that one before. So, so it's not house data, it's profit data, but so you should be using that one for the first one. Um, and let's see if I got the other one right. Yeah, the other one is the assignment to exam data. So that, that has some um, uh, data for, for a classification, for, for doing classifier on, so. So yeah, you should, uh, I mean, I didn't give you the, the thing to load these. So, you know, you might have to add some, um, uh, you know, you might have to specify some parameters to the read CSV or something like that. So that's kind of part of the assignment. Um, but but yeah, they are the files. You know, the the profit just has one column, which is the um, independent variable, and you're supposed to be predicting the profit. That's the dependent variable for the regression problem here. Um, and the other has two columns. Um, which are two features, which are actually as exam scores from zero to 100 for different students. And then the, the, the third column is the admit or no admit. So that's your binary class that you're supposed to be building a classifier for um, here. So. Assuming one is admission being admitted, zero yeah, is being not right. admitted on that. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Although, I mean, I mean, it doesn't ultimately really make a difference, but yeah, one, one means ad admitted and, and zero means not admitted, I think, so. On the other, the profit data. Uh-huh. The, um, when we were running it on the predict model, you, we want to run it for all of the population that are given that we already have in the list. We're not doing any new, right? You just want to run it against what's already there. Um, yeah, so um, I, I think I kept it sure. simple. Like, right, yeah, I think I kept it simple, especially for the first question. So so I didn't really even ask for any, any cross-validation. So yeah, you can just train the, the whole model on the uh, on the data there, I think. And then when the plotting it, are you just use those numbers that we get to plot the line? Did you want it to to put the original plot, the scatter plot back into it so it shows the two data, you know, one on top of each other? Uh well, yeah, yeah, you should or probably uh, you should probably yeah, you should probably plot both the original data and the, the fitted line for the regression problem. Um and then the the plot Do we need to worry about the uh, Do we need that? I missed part of that. What was that again? Um, do we need the um, to the error bars on that? The confidence uh, intervals. Oh no. On that plot. No, uh, you don't have to. Although. Okay. Although, yeah, feel free to use you know Seaborn if you want to, and you'd get you would get your uh, bar, you'd get your um, region if you wanted to, but. Uh, uh, but but yeah, probably just uh, as long as you have the the fitted line and and the data that was that was fitted to on there for that first one. So the second one, um, uh, 
Um, so for so for the regression uh, for the um, classification problem using log logistic regression. Um, There's a couple of different ways you could show the um, you could you could show the resulting decision boundary. So um, it's simple enough in this case that you could find the coefficients and and then calculate what the line is that 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 those coefficients rep the you know the decision boundary that those coefficients. Um, uh, give you so, or you could use the uh, the little trick of of using a contour plot that we show a lot of in um, this week's, I believe, or was it uh, this week's notebook? Um, at some time for showing the uh, the um, decision boundary on on these here. So. I see here. I'm trying to remember. Oh, that's right. I probably didn't really show any examples yet, so I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. So, so yeah, when you're plotting the uh, the decision boundary for the second for the um, classification problem on the assignment. Um, you'll, you, you might want to take a look at the, um, um, Oh, the uh, the other notebook that I had for this week uh, about or for for these these last two weeks, um, which is in archive right now. But um, but yeah, you'll want to do something similar to um, Thought I had an example of that. Maybe I didn't over here. Uh, okay. Anyway, well, I have to check on that. So I, I was trying to try to remember if I had a good example of. Um, so one of the things on assignment two was um, also to kind of display the, uh, the the coefficients for the second one as well. So that's a little bit more, this a little trickier. So I'll just say, in case I didn't have a good example of that, um, that uh, basically the, the, the coefficients that you get will define um, another line. Um, and you can use that to um, display the, 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 the boundary here, so. Is that the thresholds on the uh, binary that you're referring to? Yeah. So, or it, I mean, it's basically the location where you know it. it uh, um, so, if you do this logistic regression, um, the model that you'll create, um, if you use a basic one, will be a linear model. Um, so it'll end up being a line. Uh, there'll be a boundary. Uh, where you cross over from predicting a zero to predicting a one. So that's our decision boundary here. So there's a couple of different ways you, you could plot that. So the easiest is probably to use directly the parameters. So. The binary classification notebook 
had the threshold um, graph in it. I'm just wondering if that's what you're referring to. You have it open already, the HML, HML, yeah, that one. It's towards about two thirds of the way down. Yeah, I'm not sure. I have to check. So, so okay. we will we will talk more about decision boundaries. Um, but uh, but yeah, I might have had that might not be till um, a later time here. So I might have to pull some of that material over. Uh, all right. Anyway. So yeah, in terms of using the stats model, um, most of the stuff is going to be pretty similar to what I do in the video, though. So you want to uh, you want to look at that. Um, so stats model is uh, another library we won't use a lot um, after this assignment, um, but um, it's a good kind of um, comparison to uh, building the same models but using Scikit-Learn basically. So. Um, all right, let's see. So I guess I, I was thinking that um, I might kind of go back to our previous week, maybe look at that material, see if there's any, if you might have to have some questions or some discussions about those. Um, and, um, and also, yeah, we can look at the, um, the things from this week as well. So kind of th this week and, and uh, the, the previous week and this week, um, So, so we're looking at the the you know the, the chapters two and three from our um, hands-on machine learning textbook. Um, so, really, in my mind, what what I'm trying to get you guys to do on these two weeks is, um, well, first of all, is kind of the uh, become familiar with at a high level the Scikit-Learn framework. Okay, so um, so you know this this framework that we're using for doing machine learning um, that we'll be primarily using is, is in many ways it's a very good um, example of, of a framework so it, it's a lot of people really like it um, and um, and I'm certainly one of them because it, it's very consistent um, um, and um, you know and, and the, the way it defines things gives you a very good way of thinking about actually about about how to divide problems up and and um, um, you know and, and 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 how you should be thinking about uh, getting data and 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 applying these sorts of models in order to uh, uh, be able to build a model and, and do whatever your task is so classification and regression um, that we're talking about for these two weeks so so, and then, yeah, secondarily, kind of we worked through, so the previous week, hopefully everybody has gotten through most of that material. We were working on a regression problem, which is where we want to, it's, it's a type, both of these are types of um, supervised learning, right? So, so a regression problem is where we're trying to predict basically a real valued number. So like, a, um, I mean, the price of the house, house prices we've been using a lot, but the things like, you know, weight or mass or, um, um, or height or things like that. So anything you can express with a, um, a floating point number. So, so 
and then you know this week we're looking then at classification problems but again using scikit-learn right so um, you know I, I think I discussed a little bit at some places that uh, the, the I mean the boundaries aren't completely 100% firm right so you know you can treat problems um, some types of problems you can treat um, either way right so you know if you think of house prices um, if you rounded it off to the nearest dollar I mean you could have that as a very large number of categories um, um, so if your prices range from hundred thousand dollars to five hundred thousand dollars you'd, you'd, you'd have uh, that, that would probably be a, a, a uh, uh, probably that would probably be too many categories that many so that would be what 400,000 separate categories so that's a lot um, but you can always turn a regression problem into a classification problem by discretizing it right so 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 with house prices I could always define ranges like every fifty thousand dollars and so then my one category is Houses in, in the range from 100 to 150 thousand dollars, and then and then my next category is 150 thousand, 200 thousand, and so on, right? Um, so and, and sometimes it's valuable to you know um, turn a regression problem into a classification problem, but sometimes it's not. It really depends on context. So so that might help you build a better model. Um, but it, or, or that might make things more complicated or worse. So it really, again, it really depends on what you're trying to do, what your goals are, what the data is. So. Uh, but yeah, going in the reverse direction isn't always possible. So um, it isn't isn't usually possible. So if, if you have discrete categories, um, um, you can't really turn that into a real valued number at least uh, I mean not unless there's some special case you know, even even um, I, I also talk about I should probably go ahead and bring up um, you know I'm, I'm sure I talk about these in some places um, but um, let's go up and bring up this first one here so maybe I'll scroll through this talk some more about it, see if people have some other questions about these things. Um, but uh, yeah, the other thing, well, because I'm I'm talking a little bit about um, classification at the moment. Um, so the, the other thing about classification problems is, is um, it can be that your categories really have no relationship to each other. So if there's no natural ordering that, you know, this category is comes first and then this category second and third and so on, uh, then it's going to be really tough to kind of treat that as a regression problem. So, um, anyway, let's let's go back. Let's go back. Um, kind of start back from week three here. So, um, or, or, I'm sorry. Uh, I meant um, let's go back to the the chapter two from week three. Um, our regression problem here. So if there's any questions. So there, there's, there's a lot of material here. Um, chapter two is kind of interesting. Um, a big picture kind of chapter, as I mentioned a couple of times. So giving you um, at least a flavor of the end-to-end -end sorts of things that you do um, for a real machine learning project, right? And in a class like this, you know, we, we tend to emphasize the stuff that we talk about in in the what I called the third part here at, at the end of chapter two, which was training a machine learning model. Um, so, so training it and then evaluating how well it's doing on train on, on, on the data, right? But I mean, if you ask any a person who's out in the trenches doing machine learning, whether they're a data data analytics analyst or a or, or a, a research scientist doing some kind of modeling, um, you know, they'll they'll tell you that you, that really you, you spend a lot more of your time usually on the data exploration, the data cleaning, right? So, um, 
so it's definitely good that, that you at least kind of look at these things and, and kind of understand that those are um, uh, important pieces, right? Um, they're, they're harder to teach in a single class. Um, and, and I don't know, in, in my mind, um, the, there, there tends to be a little bit more of, of art than science on these parts. So, so becoming good at, at, you know, exploring data and cleaning it to get it ready so you can make good machine learning models, um, uh, there, there can be a lot of subtleties in that, you know, so. Um, So yeah, and that said, I, I don't know if I'm gonna you know say a whole lot on 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 these here as I kind of uh, scroll through them, think about what we had um, as examples in here. You know, so for a real project, you're gonna start with data that you may have had no um, hand in collecting. You know, so um, um, so. It can be very tough even getting started. You have to bring up the raw data, see what you have, see if you can even identify what the columns are, if there are columns, you know, what you need to do in order to get the data loaded, um, uh, even initially, so you can start doing some visualizations with it, um, can, you know, uh, take some time, right? Um, so, and, and, you know, real data from, from real data sources is going to be messy and, and it might be collected from, from lots of different places. So you might have inconsistencies in, in, in values, uh, even in the same column that maybe got merged together from different sources, but they did it in different ways, you know, so. So yeah, I mean, this is often a messy and, and time consuming portion, you know, getting the data and taking, looking at it and, and getting it cleaned up so you can actually begin to use it um, in production, so. Um, so yeah, I mean, even before you could like get some portion of it loaded into memory into like a data frame so that you could take a quick look at it, you know, you might have a lot of stuff you'd have to do before that, right? And for truly big data, you know, first of all, you'd have to be doing some sampling, right? So you can't load, you might not be able to load all of the data into memory at once. So you have to do something to maybe random sample some um, rows, uh, assuming that you've got something that, that's really a table where rows are like, um, are samples that you have of some data set and columns or features, right? But, but yeah, for a truly big data set, you know, um, you might have to have it across a couple of different tables. So you might have to do some joins to get it all together. Uh, and you might also have to sample your columns. So you might have so many columns that, that, that you can't really handle them all at once. So. Um, so, I mean, you know, a good visual, say a good, becoming good at being able to visualize this stuff and build good visualizations is really important in my experience. So that, that really helps you um, kind of on this phase of a, of a project. Um, to you know, get a handle on what you've got, and 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 then to be able to come up with ideas on what you need to do to get the data, um, you know, to, to to get the actual features that you need to build good models and train good models with. So that, that was kind of what the the goal of this section of our textbook uh, was about. This example of a visualization that, that was being done here. So. Um, so yeah, I mean, kind of when you're ready to, to, to start trying to clean up the data so you can actually use it for modeling, 
um, you know, some of the, the stuff, your, your basic stuff that you're going to be doing is things like this, you know, looking for correlations. So, you know, if, if two or more features are highly correlated, um, it's a good chance that, that those features, not all of them are going to be useful, right? Because if they're, if they're highly correlated, that, that means that they're really the same, they're giving you the same information. So, so looking for correlations among your features is, 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 is kind of one of the first things you'll do for, among numeric features. Um, but then also maybe trying to derive new features from existing features. So, so sometimes um, it helps to hand engineer you know, it, it can really help the performance of your models um, if you um, make the signal clearer uh, for the features that you actually have and, and, and derive some new features from them. So, so I don't know if, if the example that we had from the textbook was, was a real great example of that, but, but that's kind of what it was getting at um, here, talking about looking at combinations of features and things. Uh, so the second part was um, then um, all about uh, kind of preparing and um, uh, so data cleaning and data preparation, right? Um, so like I said, in, in my experience, this, this is the part that, that um, really, in order to get good results, you know, when you're ready to start modeling, you know, that, that, that you've got your data prepared well, right? So, um, and, and if you're having bad results, kind of the, the, your workflow, your iteration is to kind of come back to this part and and, uh, and 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 even the previous one and, and try and re-engineer some more features um and 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 look at some different kinds of, of cleaning and transformations that you can do to um you know again your your goal on these is, is you know you're, you're trying to anticipate a bit but you're trying to look for um ways to enhance the possible signals that you might have in your data so that you can um, uh, get better models when you're ready to, to train with them. So, um, so yeah, I mean, you know, this, this chapter from our textbook was examples of some of the kinds of things that you might have to do in, in the realm of data preparation and data cleaning. Um, so yeah, probably, probably the, the first most fundamental one is, uh, you know, what are you going to do with missing values, right? So that, that's kind of what we started off with here. Um, so, yeah, you know, again, for a real data set, uh, you'll probably never be lucky enough to have, you know, data that's so well, that was so well gathered, um, that, uh, that that you don't have missing data and, and maybe lots of it in different places. So, so and that's going to always be a problem of, of what you're going to do with it, right? So the kind of the most coarse grained thing you can do is just get rid of any sample that has some missing data, right? But you might be losing a lot of, of important stuff if you do that. So, but, but that's, that's the, the most conservative, most coarse grained thing. And kind of at the other end of the scale is you could try and keep everything and then where you have to maybe try and make up values, you know, so try and impute what, what the likely value might be, right? But again, this, can, this is dangerous in a different way. So if you're making bad assumptions and making up bad data, your, your models then are going to, you know, be 
uh, are, are, are going to be being built on things that aren't real, you know, on, on not real information. So, so they'll be kind of garbage in that case, if you're, if you're doing too much of this or, or um, um, not doing it well. But, you know, in limited cases, you know, so the simplest idea of these is, is you might just feel, if you, if you only have a few, like if only a couple percent of your values are missing for some particular feature, it might be good enough just to fill in the missing ones with the average or the, the mean or the median or something like that for that column. And, and again, all these, these strategies are going to depend on what the feature is that you're trying to fill in and, and um, you know, ultimately what your, um, what you're trying to do, so your overall goal for the, the, the system you're trying to build. Uh, um, so anyway, there's some, there's some examples in this. So I guess oh, another thing and that we start with um, in um, the second part here was we begin using heavily the scikit-learn uh, framework for doing these kinds of things. So, <clears throat> so scikit-learn has this idea of a, of a pipeline, a, um, um, a, a transformation pipeline, right? So, to me, this is very similar to ideas of um, of like using pipes um, on on a command line. So it's, it's, it's basically it's basically a, a transformation. So um, where the output of one transformer is fed as the input into the next one, right? So if you have that idea set up, um, your transformer should always take something and 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 output the same sort of thing so that that can be fed into the next item in your pipeline. And that, that's how these sorts of data cleaning pipelines work in scikit-learn. So they expect a, a, a table basically, you know, like, like a NumPy array as input and, and they're going to be outputting um, the same sort of table, uh, but, but possibly applying some transformation to it. So anyway, I mean, you know, for missing values, you can create simple imputers, so, so simple things to like just fill in missing values with the medians or the means or things like that. Um, and, and yeah, the most basic step is um, once you have one of these, um, you call it on like a, a table. So house num, housing uh, num is gonna be our table here. Um, and um, when it transforms, it, it, you'll get a new table, basically. Um, so, let's see. Sorry, just trying to remember um, some of the other things here. So one thing I kind of skipped over was, um, so we often have to clean categorical data slightly differently than we clean numeric data. So, so I think kind of um, one thing I passed over here was that we'd, we'd sort of split, um, not, not, not a train test split, but we'd split out the numerical data from the categorical data um, at some point here when we were talking about doing our cleaning um, and data transformations here. Um, anyway, yeah, so I'm sure we'll see that later on here. Uh, and then there's other kinds of, of data clean transformers that are available besides, you know, um, 
handling missing values. Uh, um, oh yeah, so um, I did talk a little bit about the design, um, about uh, uh, the, the, the design philosophy that the Scikit-Learn API, this, this was kind of the thing I was talking about. So a lot of people really uh, admire the, the, the clean uh, API that, that um, Scikit-Learn gives, you know, so it can really help you think about, um, um, you know, the, what you need to do um, um, on a, on a, pro, on a, on a data analytics project like this, so, and, and that help you kind of get your thoughts in order. So, um, So it is an, uh, an object-oriented um, API, scikit-learn. Um, so it defines kind of three main um, objects, uh, estimators, transformers, and predictors. Um, and um, so kind of as I talked about quickly here, it, 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 it sort of uses duct typing. So it's, it's easy for you to fit your own things into the scikit-learn API, all you have to do is create your own objects that, that, that have the expected methods, you know. So if, if you need to have your own kind of custom transformer, um, you know, all you have to do is define an object that has a transform method um, that generally takes, you know, an array-like thing, table as input and transforms to a, a table as output. Um, and, and estimators are basically what I would have called uh, the, the the things that do the training, you know, that, that, that fit a model to data. So, so those are estimators in scikit-learn, they have a fit function. Um, so, so you often have to do fit transforms together. Um, so, so you have fit estimator objects with fit functions and transform objects with them. Um, transform objects, um, and um, you might have things that are both estimators and transformers um, that will have a fit transform method. Um, and then for supervised learning, uh, your goal is to build a model that can do predictions. So, so the things you'll end up creating will be predictors that will have a predict method as kind of the main thing of the API, right? So for, for supervised learning, um, like we're talking about here, uh, once you've fit your model to the data, um, you can ask it to, to give you predictions on data it hasn't seen before, for, for example. So yeah, and then yeah, these are all kind of so this, for example, um, all scikit-learn objects allow you to kind of inspect uh, their their things. So basically, you'll be able to look at the parameters for like a, um, a, a an, an estimator that were learned after the fit by looking at. Um, um, you know, by, by inspecting um, parameters of your model. So, so we had examples of those um, in our notebooks and you'll have to use that for the second assignment, for example. Um, Okay, yeah, let's move on. So, so besides numerical data, sometimes, you know, you have to clean, so there, there's, there's really kind of two general sorts of, of, of data, right, um, that, that you might have in a column. Um, so, so it's either going to be, well, I mean, it's not just two, but um, um, uh, 
kind of for, for building models with, you know, so for building a machine learning model, it, we have to ultimately, everything has to be a number, right? So we can't really build a model uh, where a feature is some uh, piece of text or something more complicated, right? So, um, So like for your, your um, second data set here, you know, we, we've got uh, three columns here, three features, although this one is gonna actually be our target label instead of uh, an input feature. Um, but, um, but this to be, so, so, you know, numeric data will either have um, integers, so, so whole numbers, or we'll have some, uh, we'll need to be able to represent real value numbers, but those are our two main types of numeric data, right? Uh, but then other kinds of data that we'll have will represent categories. Um, and we can ultimately um, give a mapping between the, the, the category labels and uh, some integer, like, like zero and one for a binary category like we have here, um, which is representing admit or not admit. But you know, sometimes we have a categorical feature that's more uh, than than binary. So we can certainly have uh, features that are um, you know three, four, five, or or many um, values in the category, right? So that was kind of the, the second part here was just talking a little bit about handling uh, categorical and, and textual. So textual information, you either have to turn into a category somehow or maybe a number um, or, or do something else, you know. So uh, like again, um, if we have uh, the address, you know, like latitude and longitude are already numbers. So we could presumably use those directly, um, feed those into a machine learning classifier um, that we're building. But, but if we had something like a street address, uh, we might want to be able to try and turn that into maybe latitude and longitude. Like, like so if we, we instead had a street address instead of latitude and longitude, uh, we might use some external database to try and look that up and convert it into its exact position, just as an example. Right? But the other kind of thing that might show up as, as string data uh, might be things like this, but these really represent uh, categories, uh, so some categorical information. So um, instead of, you know, just like a binary category of on, on the ocean or inland, you know, we've, we've got slightly more um, levels to this particular um, piece of, this particular feature in, in our data set. So, so near the ocean, less than one hour from the ocean, to, um, you know, pretty far away, so you're inland or um, on the ocean, which we didn't see here, but, um, oh yeah, here, here's all of the, the ones. So, so um, Pandas has lots of things to help you, you know, so when you first load this into like a Pandas data frame, this is gonna come out as an object D type, right? Which is kind of what, what Pandas will default to if, if it, doesn't know how to convert it into a number or uh, directly into a category somehow. But you can really think of this as textual information and you'll have to by hand uh, either turn it into a number or into um, a category, a categorical variable. So. So value count, if, if, if you think of something needs to be a categorical variable, value counts is, is a very useful. So this will give you what the actual labels are. I'm mean, gonna allow you to see like, for example, here, this, this data, um, I'm sure I said this in the video. So this data doesn't need a whole lot of cleaning. So a more typical thing you might see if this data was collected by a bunch of different people or agencies is, you know, the, they, they allowed the, the, the data, um, the people that were inputting the data to just fill in a string into a form somewhere. So some people use inland and some people used uh, misspelled it. So you might have several different spellings of, of something like this that all meant inland um, and, um, and you know, so on, right? So, so real data is gonna probably be a lot more messy than, 
than than this. Uh, in, in this case, our value counts looks like you know. So we don't seem to have several different spellings of inland or something like that. Um, and we've only got these uh, five different levels here, right? Um, oh, and this is another, um, so that um, you know, I've been trying to explain. So here, that there might really be kind of an ordering relationship. So if you have something that's categorical information, sometimes there's no real real ordering. So you can't really define that, that this one should come before or this one after that that value of, of, of your, your category of, of the labels of your category, right? But here you, you can you can definitely see that, that you can think of, 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 a, of an ordering. So in terms of how far away they are, although do you call um, um, so I guess maybe you would think of island as the closest, you know, it's right on, it's right in the, the ocean. Then, then the next closest might be near ocean or near bay, right? Thinking, thinking of a bay as being a little bit further away from the ocean. So, um, and then less than one hour from ocean is, is closer than inland, right? So. So anyway, that's that's kind of what I meant by a, an ordering. So sometimes for a categorical variable, you'll have an ordering. When you have an ordering, then then it's it's a little bit more like um, a real valued number, right? So we could, if if instead of having this, maybe I, you could go off and recollect this data, but you actually have the the the, the distance in miles or, or or kilometers from the house to the nearest ocean access point or something like that right so in that case that would be how you would turn something like this into an actual regression um, feature you know a real valued um, um, number here so. um, but um, yeah anyway so um, once you get that far, then you can figure out how you, how you want to treat this. Uh, if you want to treat this as a categorical variable, how you would change that. And again, you know, you could, you could define a mapping by hand. So assign each one of these an integer value to define your category. Um, although, you know, doing these by hand is probably not a good idea. So again, you probably want to use like the scikit-learn framework to, um, um, encode. So, so here we're showing uh, an ordinal encoder, which is uh, assigning an integer value, right? Um, uh, another common encoder um, is to use one-hot encoding. So, so yeah, I mean, if there's no inherent order, um, it's a little bit, if, It, it, it can be confusing to, to some machine learning categories to have this as a feature because then it will think that three and four, since they're closer, that those, those uh, things that have the, the feature three and four should be more similar than things that have feature one and four, right? Uh, so, so it will use the inherent ordering of the integer encoding for an ordinal encoding. Um, as part of the information for the input or the output, if this was your um, the label that you're going to end up trying to predict. So, um, so yeah, if you don't have uh, inherent ordering, which in this case we, we kind of maybe do, but 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 if if you wanted to say that that uh, we shouldn't have that ordering, um, you can instead use a one hot encoding. So here. For every level of your category, you end up having to create a new column in your table, um, and then each column represents the presence or absence of that um, that that feature, right? So, so this column is whatever, like um, uh, being uh, um, 
a, a, a house on an island. Um, so you're on an island or you're not. Right? And so that in that case, only one of these should have a one if if all if these are all mutually ex exclusive uh, categories here. Um, yeah, and then, you know, there's an example of kind of what I was talking about, that duck typing. So if you want to build your own um, transformer here, um, you can do it by creating a class. So you have to kind of know how to do classes in Python like we talked about in, in week one, um, but then you just need to have the right methods. So if you want it to be a, a um, estimator, you have to have a fit method, and yeah, if you want it to be a, a transformer, you have to have a transform method. And both of these take like a, a table of values, so you think of that as an umpire array, um, and will return a table as well um, after doing some transformation on it. Um, um, All right, and then another common data cleaning that we want to, actually this is more like data preparation, um, is uh, feature scaling. So, um, so some machine learning methods are very sensitive to having features of different scales. Um, and that's definitely the case for this example data that we have here. Uh, you know, so, um, I mean, just looking at like the mean, right? So what we mean by different scales is that, um, you know, so we've got some things that, that have a mean of three and, and kind of range from a minimum of 0.4 to 15, right? Down here at the median income, but we got other things, uh, even the, maybe even leaving the size, so maybe we don't want to use latitude and longitude as a feature, but, um, Um, we've got things like median age and, and so, so, so there are different scales for these. So that, that can cause um, issues with some machine learning classifiers. Um, um, so the, the standard way is to, to scale these. So you can use um, like min-max scale. And, and again, you only do this for numeric kind of features, uh, features that are already floating point numbers or, or integer values, uh, you might want to scale um, either way. So, so in, in one, we kind of scale everything to between, be to, between zero and one. Um, and then the other, the other way, we, we scale everything to have like a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So. Um, Um, all right, so then kind of the kind of the, the most important thing though is that at the end here on this second one kind of showing this idea of a pipeline. So putting it together. So when you're ready to do data cleaning. So if, if you do all this by hand, uh, it could be a real pain to get it so you can do it repeatedly. Uh, so have a repeatable data cleaning um, pipeline. So that's, you know, that's, that's just what these kinds of objects in the scikit-learn give you is, is, is a pretty easy way to define a, a pipeline of transformation so that you can always kind of go from your raw data uh, and apply the same transformations to end up with the clean data that you can then use for training, right? And you can always have, you know, alternate pipelines if, if you want to do some explorations of doing some different kinds of, um, of, of training. So, so you might have one pipeline that does scaling in one way and have, have another pipeline that um, 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 maybe uh, uses a one-hot encoding versus a ordinal encoding or you know, things like that. So, so here, these, these are pretty nice. So as long as these are all um, um, transformers, uh, so you can, you can create individual transformers and then gather them into a pipeline. So the, the pipeline then you can just call once. Uh, the, the final thing for this kind of a um, pipeline has to be a, a, a fit transformer, um, if I'm remembering right. So, um, 
So yeah, these are all the, the, the pipeline when you call it, then we'll just call the transform on each one of these in sequence. And again, remember the transformer should take something that's table-like as input and give you a table-like thing as output, and then it'll just feed that table to the next transformer through the pipeline to get your ultimate result of, you know, so, so this is this, your, your, your end result of, of going through this pipeline is a, um, um, a transform table that's gone through all of these, you know, so we've, we've filled in missing values, um, we've, we've added, you know, we, we've done some feature engineering, so we combined some attributes and added a new feature, um, and we applied some scaling to our numeric values. So. Yeah, and, and since you have to kind of handle um, numeric attributes slightly different from um, um, categorical information, so there is kind of an idea. This you didn't. You, this is a relatively new thing to Scikit-Learn, if I remember right. So, so now they do have something that allows you to kind of split off, so you can handle some columns using a, a, a one pipeline. You know, so your numerical columns using one pipeline. Um, and your categorical columns using a different pipeline, um, but then combine them together um, at the end. So. Um, all right, so that was that was kind of the. Uh, the things from last week, although yeah, we haven't done the third part yet, so maybe I won't spend as much time on that. Um, but uh, yeah, why don't we go and take um, five minutes here? Just take a uh, a quick break and pause the recording here, so I can get a drink of water, uh, and then we'll come back. See if there's any questions about uh, the classification stuff from this week. Um, yeah. All right. Um, all right, uh, let me go ahead and start again. So, um, so can those of you that are here, can you guys still hear me now? Yes. All right, thanks. Uh, so, If, uh, you know, so I don't know if anybody had any questions or if we want to go back to assignment two, I wouldn't quite keep track of anybody kind of came late after we talked about that. So let me know if you have that, uh, or if, if you want to ask anything about assignment two. Um, So I'll just finish these up, I guess. Um, the, uh, the the for our um, materials for last week. Kind of look through here. So like I said, uh, in, uh, so most of our course is really going to be kind of spent on issues about um, training models uh, and fine tuning them, that kind of stuff, right? Because our, our our real goal of this course, um, um, you know, so it's not really a, go a course in data analytics. It's it's so that you understand um, at least a little bit about the internal workings of some of these uh, machine learning models and mechanisms. So, so how machine learning classifiers and regressors, how they work, uh, kind of uh, a, a little bit behind the scenes, you know. Um, so, so starting next week, we're going to start getting into the, you know, looking at the details of uh, starting with linear regression, right? So that'll be the first machine learning uh, algorithm that we'll look at in detail of, of what it means to train the model and, and how it, it, it actually works to, uh, to be able to, to, to learn predictions. Um, so, but anyway, that's kind of what the section is, and, and maybe I won't spend as much time on this so we can talk about classification a bit 
uh, the, the next chapter stuff. Um, so here, since we were using the housing uh, data here, and you know, the, again, this is a re an example of a regression problem. So we're trying to predict the median house price for these uh, California counties or districts um, in this data set, right? So, and, and you know, we had gone through, so we've, we've got um, a data transformation pipeline, which we basically recreate uh, on this here so we can run this notebook um, that, you know, fills in some missing values, um, combines some attributes to try and make the signal a little bit stronger for some of these things, um, does some standard scaling um, of the data, since we're going to use like a, a linear regression um, on the model, and linear regression is sensitive to the scale of the features. So. Oh, and, and uses a one-hot encoding for the uh, near ocean, <clears throat> um, for, for the ocean proximity um, attribute. So. Um, So, um, so as we already mentioned, the most of the models that we'll work with here, well, I mean, all of them are uh, examples of estimator models, as scikit-learn calls them. Um, so the, the basic way you use them, so, so this, is, this is the same pattern. So, so the, the other, the, the, the transforms um, are, are for doing data, you know, the, the data pipeline, data cleaning stuff, the, those transform objects are more for that. Um, so estimators we use more uh, when we're ready to build, select a model and train it um, on a set of data. Um, and, and no matter what we're using then, though, it, it, it basically will look the same as this. So, so whatever machine learning method we're using, you create an instance of the machine learning algorithm, the machine learning estimator, that you want to apply to the data set that you've prepared already, right? Um, and then you fit the, the data to the labels, okay? So I didn't, you know, so, so basically part of this data clean, we, we've also, we extracted out the labels, um, which were, um, uh, again, these were actually the housing prices. So, so maybe labels isn't a great name here, but those were the housing prices. Uh, and this was our prepared data. And fit always takes just those two parameters. It, you know, it takes a table of data. So this could be a NumPy array or a pandas array, or, or in this case, it's, a, it's, it's basically a NumPy array that's been um, put through our uh, data cleaning pipeline here. So it's had the attributes scaled and, and uh, missing data filled in and so on. And since this is a, um, since this is a um, supervised learning, um, we're going to fit the data to the label. So we want it to make a model of our data um, to try and predict the house prices, basically, um, from our features that we have in our data set. So one thing that's missing from, from this, and then after that, the model will be fit, and you can use that model to do predictions, right? So our our, um, um, our estimator um, uh, this is uh, so so these these objects are both um, well, well anyway. So so you've got a fit method, and then we've got a predict method, so that we can uh, um, predict what the price would be on new data that we haven't seen. So, um, so one thing that's missing from this, the, the, when, when you first create the objects, when you first create an instance of whatever machine learning method you're going to use, you might apply um, some um, meta parameters. So the, the meta parameters that you specify, you would, you would give um, to the object when you create it here. Right. So you can see those by, um, for example, opening up the contextual help. 
Although I might have to rerun my notebook to get that here. So if we run those and we get the uh, the um, linear regression model um, loaded here, we should be able to see it. Um, 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 so yeah, this help tells you some of the things like you know the the attributes that you can get from it, like the coefficients um, and the intercepts. These are the actual the parameters that were fitted. Right, you'll understand more about what these are um, after next week. Um, but um, you can also specify um, parameters for the fit here. Although it doesn't show a lot of them, so so often you'll see a lot more. So I, I think there's some others. Um, I'm not certain how you see them, but um, anyway. Um, so uh, so once you fit a model, then you can yeah use it to do predictions. Um, Although you do have to be careful, so um, the, uh, a model that's fitted to data is going to expect data you want to make predictions on to have gone through the same um, transformation. So again, another reason why you want to have a pipeline that's um, fully reproducible that you can run any time to do the transformations that you need. Um, so you know, so if you wanted to do this, use this model in a production environment where you're getting new data being collected, like say on a on a website or something. Uh, so whenever somebody submits a web form, you'd have to take all the data that they input um, and put it through the same transformation, so that you can then use your predictor, or in this case, a, a linear regression model, um, and make predictions on it. So. Um, oh yeah, I have run these now. So, so in this case, we were actually running predictions on um, the same data that we tr we trained our model with. Um, but you know, uh, this is a uh, Kind of an indication of, of how it's doing, you know. So our predictions were the first; these were the first five predictions that we had for this data, and, and these were the actual labels. So these are the true values that we were trying to target uh, with our model. So. And we'll later on see talk much more about. Uh, so how do we evaluate how well it's doing, right? So you can kind of eyeball and see that. Um, for a house with 317,000, um, or for, for a house where the median price was 340,000, not a house, but a district, where, where it had a median price of that, we're predicting 317. So, you know, it's, I mean, it's at least kind of in the ballpark. And so for houses with, uh, where the median price was pretty low, only 46,000, um, you know, we're off, but, but we're still predicting lower in general. So anyway, um, there's ways to measure the performance in a more, um, uh, you know, there's more formal definitions that we'll talk about, about how you tell, you know, how well is my model doing at predicting um, these kinds of values and things. So. Um, but yeah, so, you know, like we showed here, you know, if, if you want to use different machine learning algorithms, the, the pattern will be exactly the same. You just use a different model, like a decision tree regressor here, right? And, and again, in this case, we're not using, um, we're not specifying any of the metaparameters. So in the previous notebook, we talked about um, one of the features of scikit-learn that has um, good defaults. Um, you know, so again, most of these metaparameters should work 
okay usually if you just accept the defaults, but um, you know not always. So, so you'll want to tweak these to try and increase your performance. Um, you know, the, so in this case, decision trees have parameters like the no, the number of leaf nodes that you want to use and um, other stuff. So. But um, but yeah, once you fit your model, then you can um, use it to do predictions uh, using the predict function, and then you can evaluate its performance, same as, as we did before. Um, so I had a, a question, somebody's asking about on staff's model, um, and it's a good question I should have pointed out. So by default, um, scikit-learn expects that um, um, you don't um, you don't have to add any features. What are known as um, uh, this dummy feature, this intercept feature, the stats model does. Um, so we basically for for scikit-learn we we just uh, pass. In, I mean, after we do our data cleaning. Uh, but we pass in that data with those features um, to um, to our fit function, basically, right? So if you look at um, the the stats model library, we had to do this extra step. So yeah, before I moved on from linear regression, it might be worth looking at that real quickly. Um, So like in the example for linear regression that we do um, in stats model, uh, I mean, it has some similarity. So I mean, the names are different, um, but um, oh, oh no, that's, that's SK learns there. Um, Uh, I guess I got the wrong notebook here. I thought I had some stats models examples in here. Yeah, maybe I, maybe I gave you guys the wrong one here. I got I got check here. I'm, I'm, oh yeah, so I guess maybe I did. Hopefully, I didn't give the wrong one. I got to go back and check my content here. So yeah, I think I did mean for you guys to actually look at this one, um, and that was the one I hopefully used in the video as well. So the, yeah, here, here's here's what I was looking for. So uh, so there are some examples of using the um, stats model um, in this one here. So for example, uh, here, if I found it. Um, so if you want to do a, a linear regression with STAS model, um, I mean, there's some similarity, you know, I mean, the names are different. So um, it calls its object SM. Um, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the, the STAS model API. So it, it calls the, um, the, the, the object for doing um, linear regression, just an ordinary least squares model, which is kind of another name for basically the same idea. So, but, but yeah, if, if you want to fit a linear regression, you use the OLS um, object from stats model. 
um, although it, it reverses the parameters here, so be careful about that. So scikit-learn, when you and and you you fit the model by giving the parameters when you create the instance of the object, um, or, or well, you give the parameters and then you call a separate fit function. So and, you know these are just differences in in how the different creators of these libraries specify their API. So anyway, that's, that's how you do it for stats model. Um, but yeah, the question was asking about um, you actually. The, the the table of input data that you pass in, um, you have to add in this constant feature. Um, so, I mean, this will make if this will make a lot more sense um, uh, when we look at the details of how um, linear regression works. So, so, so why we're adding in a feature here, uh, and and actually, Scikit-Learn when it does a linear regression, it's 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 doing this for you behind the scenes. Uh, so when Scikit-Learn does its fit, um, um, it will kind of add in this dummy constant. Um, uh, feature here, right? So why doesn't stats model do that? Uh, uh, the stats model library do that for you, you know, and, and you know, it does look from the point of view, if you're using scikit-learn um, um, and, and, and trying to do linear regression, that um, um, it, it's, uh, that scikit-learn is much easier to use in that term, so it's much higher level. Um, I, the, the reason why is, is again, probably historical. Um, so the way that, that, that people from a statistics background uh, normally uh, um, do this kinds of uh, linear regression, uh, they're just used to that this parameter isn't added. And, that's, and sometimes, you, you want to fit models where you don't have um, a column for what's known as the, um, the intercept parameter for your linear regression, okay? So there's probably a way to do that um, for scikit-learn. That, that was probably what one of the parameters were, uh, the meta, meta parameters for uh, linear regression. Um, So basically, I think it's that fit intercept parameter. So if you specify that um, as as false, um, it won't um, try and it won't add that column for you by hand. So so if, if you wanted to give it that dummy column for your inter intercept parameter by hand, you can specify this by false and add that column of ones like you have to do for the the stats model, right? So I don't know if that's, you know, um, if that's a real good explanation for why you have to do it by hand. Um, it's the, the I, I do think that the real answer is that that's the, the, the people that stats model is library is built for people from a statistics academic background expect that this is not done by default, right? So so, so they don't want the library doing it for you, um, uh, uh, usually. Um, so. so anyway, yeah, so you do have to be aware of that. Um, so it does come down to that there is a convenience method in the stats model that if you call it, will add that for you. So that if you do that, you should end up getting exactly the same um, parameters when you fit in your assignment to so you, you get exactly the same results, whether you're using the stats model library, OLS, or using um, scikit-learn's uh, linear regression um, object. Right? All right. So, 
Uh, yeah, so uh, I must have made a mistake on this. Um, um, somebody's asking about uh, finding this notebook. So let me check that after, right after we're done with the, the help session here. So I think I had meant to rename this one just that. I probably, I probably told you guys that, uh, that it's, it's called, you know, Lecture Scikit-Learn ML Framework. Um, but let me check, make sure I got the right one there. Make sure, and I'll, and I'll check, make sure that that's um, pushed out to our repository here. So this one does have some examples of, um, of using stats model anyway. There's one at least in there. So both of using stats model for linear regression and using it with um, logistic regression. So. Um, all right, yeah, some people, I mean, you know, some people are saying that they find it um, in the uh, lectures archive, some people maybe not. So. But again, I'll double check. So if you don't see it, maybe try to do a Git poll. Um, but um, I'll make sure it's out there after we're done here in a bit. So. Um, all right, yeah, so I think I'm gonna go ahead and Kind of move on unless somebody had some other questions about the materials from last week um, because I did want to talk a little bit about classification as well maybe uh, I mean there's a little bit more here but we'll get a lot more about you know um, uh, how you evaluate models um, kind of using cross-validation but this is our first introduction to cross-validation here at the end of this video um, so All right, so for this week, um, we were looking at chapter three of our hands-on machine learning textbook. So again, this is kind of more of um, um, a big picture sort of thing. So we're still looking at using the scikit-learn framework, uh, but in this case, for classification problems. So, so talking to kind of the goal of this one was um, look at some of the issues that are more specific to building um, uh, classifiers rather than regressors um, uh, using uh, supervised learning um, with the scikit-learn machine learning framework here. So um, so you know to begin with we have to have um, a classification problem to work with. So we, we use the MNIST, we'll probably, we'll probably see that this data set more uh, uses um, a couple more times in this class, I think. Um, so it's, it's just a good general data set. It's, it's not too big, but it's, it's, it's big enough to be interesting and, and not trivial to work with, right? Uh, something like a something of the fruit fly model of, of machine learning. So, anybody building a new classifier who wants to or who wants to kind of compare the performance of their classifier to existing ones might pull out the MNIST problem data set and 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 use it to compare their performance against others. So, um, so the data set is relatively easy to learn. So it's a classification problem because what we have are images like this, handwritten digits that have been digitized onto, um, what was the size? It was a 28 by 28, so 28 rows by 28 column um, grayscale pixel values. So each, each of these, so 28 times 28 is, um, is 784. So if you actually look at the data, that if you load it from scikit-learn, the, the, this, this pre-built data set for you, um, you'll see that you get, you get 70,000 rows by 784 columns, but, but really the columns are two-dimensional, 
right? Because it is image data. So these are 28 by 28 pixels. Right? Um, but, but we have 70,000 images. Um, that we can use for training, and then another 10,000 or so for testing or 20,000. Um, or no, I'm wrong, I guess it's 70,000, but we typically, typically use the first 60,000 for training and the other 10,000 for um, testing or, or um, cross-validation, so. Um, so yeah, I mean, these are grayscale. So each one of these 784 pixels uh, has a value that ranges from like zero to 255, which, you know, indicates the amount of ink, um, you know, how, how hard it was being pressed um, on that particular location. So I believe, you know, originally that, that this was a, a data set for a real problem. This was used to build um, some automated uh, mail sorting system so that was the original purpose that this was uh, data set was gathered so that you could you could automate at least the um the zip code i believe so so try to um identify the the zip code and sort the mail automatically uh, even if even if the zip codes were handwritten um using a machine sorter so kind of machine sorters are on the mail usps system are in the news <laughs> recently so um, so here, um, actually, we're going to start with the simplest uh, in, in our, our video here, um, a binary classifier. We can, we can make this into a binary classification task by doing like a, a five versus a not five, right? So, so um, in the full data set, it's, it's not a binary task. There's actually 10 categories, right? Zero, one, zero through nine. Um, but uh, binary classifier, you always start with binary classifier. And, and in fact, uh, I mean, uh, a lot of times, really, you want to use binary classifiers in real production systems anyway, because they often give you better results if you can put your data down into a yes, no decision or, or a true false kind of a classifier. So. So you can you can easily make any multi-class into a binary classifier. So you know all the fives. Um, so so our, our our label is not going to be anything that was a five will now have a label of true or one, and anything that was um, um, not a five would would have a zero for the label. Um, So I didn't talk a lot. I didn't talk about the performance measure um, that we use for regression, uh, at least not in our help session here. I do talk a lot about it in the video, right? But to, to measure your performance for regression, you basically just take the difference between your predicted, you know, like like a house price for the regression problem we had in the previous, um, and the actual house price, and that, then that difference you take the magnitude. So just uh, like the absolute value, or actually you take the square, um, and then you sum those up. And that gives you a measure for how well your predictor is doing, right? But you can't really do that for a classification task, um, because uh, the difference doesn't make sense, um, or, or as much sense, right? So again, think, think of the uh, multi-class case. Um, so are you really off, is, if, if I predict a zero and it's a nine, uh, if, if you just take the difference of those, that's, that's a magnitude a difference of nine. But, but am I wrong, more wrong to predict a nine when it's actually zero than I am to predict um, a two or something, right? So, so again, it's the, the nature of the, the um, categorical thing you're trying to predict here, the, the distance doesn't really make as much sense in terms of how far off you are when you want to compare your prediction to what the actual true label was, right? So you need a different, you know, so it comes down to you need a different way to um, 
evaluate your prediction uh, when you're trying to do a, a classification problem. So when you're trying to predict a, an output label, a discrete label here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's part of it. But the other thing, I mean, you can always measure accuracy, right? Accuracy makes um, a lot of sense for a classifier. So did I get it correct or not? Was my prediction correct or not. So for a binary classifier, did I predict a five and it was a five, in which case I was correct, or did I predict a five but it was not a five, right? So, so you can certainly always measure accuracy. Um, you, you can't really, again, you, you know, you can't measure, ac ac accuracy doesn't make sense for a regression problem, right? What, what does it mean? So you, you, you don't have a sense of whether I was correct or not. Um, so for a regression problem, it's just how close was my prediction. Um, so the best I can do for a prediction for a regression problem is to, to get it exactly right. So I have zero difference between my prediction and the values I was trying to predict. Um, but, you, but you can't really have an idea of accuracy um, for regression problems but like you can for um, classification problems here. So, um, but accuracy doesn't turn out to be a real good measure um, as, as we talked about if you watch this video or, or when you watch this video here. Um, but it's a good starting point. So for a binary classifier, we might first ask, okay, we might create what's known as the confusion matrix, right? So given that we've trained uh, a binary classifier with whatever machine learning method we're using, so um, in this case, what did we use? Um, I forgot. We used a what's known as an SGD classifier, a stochastic gradient des descent classifier here. Uh, but again, uh, and then I kind of skipped over it, but you know, it has the same sort of pattern. So you create an instance of the object that you want to build, um, you know, you want to fit or train your model with, right? And in this case, though, we finally showed some examples of using some of those metaparameters I was talking about. Uh, and then we fit it though. So we fit it, giving it the input data and our labels, since this is a supervised um, training. Um, so so uh, supervised classification that we're doing here. Um, and then from that, you can do predictions. And, and predictions will, uh, in, this, in this case, if, if we're training a classifier, the predict will give us one of the labels uh, for our target labels. And in this case, since we turned it into a binary classification task, the labels will be zero, will be true and false actually, or zero and one. So in this case, it actually got both of our predictions right for the two samples that we, that we asked it to predict for. So, um, but we can, you know, it, it doesn't help us to look at individual predictions. So what we want to know is what the accuracy is overall. Um, we can look at the accuracy overall, um, say using a confusion matrix. Um, so, you know, it, it's pretty easy to calculate this by hand, right? So this is um, the, um, I always get this mixed up. So it's, it's always good to look at the uh, little figure we had here from our textbook. So um, these are our true negatives. If, if you calculate and display the confusion matrix in the standard way, you should end up with um, your actuals are your rows and your predictions are your columns. So all of the ones where your prediction was correct uh, for where it was uh, actually uh, the negative. So we're just looking at the bin a binary classification here to start with. So whenever it was um, not a five, and we correctly predicted it was not a five, uh, this would be the count of your, what are called the true negatives in the upper left-hand corner for the uh, confusion matrix. Likewise, you know, if, if uh, it's actually, it was a five and we predicted it was a five, this will be the count of your true positives, right? So the confusion matrix tells you that, um, your kind of gives you some measures of your accuracy, but it also gives you some, some, 
measure some idea of how you're doing when you were wrong with your predictions, right? So here are the false negatives. So this is the, the, the cases where um, it was actually a five, um, but we didn't predict it was a five, right? So, so we falsely gave a negative result. We, we were falsely predicting not five or something that was a five. And, and, and false positives are here. So we're falsely predicting a five for something that wasn't a five. So if, if you look at the raw output of a confusion matrix, to go back up here a little bit, um, that was the, um, that's what we're getting here. So our, our true negatives and our false negatives, um, our, our, our true negatives and our true positives, and then our false negatives and false positives on the auth diagonal um, here. And again, hopefully, I mean, if you do do this by hand, you know, make certain that you follow kind of the convention when you display this, or else you'll confuse people and confuse yourself. So, so you should have your rows or your actual, starting with the negative and positive, so zero, one, and zero, one, if, if you're doing a binary. And so this will be your true negatives, where, you, where um, the actual is zero and your predict zero. And this will be your true positives, where the actual is one and predict one. Um, so yeah, and, and a perfect classifier, um, if, if, if you're never getting anything wrong, would only have true positives and true negatives, right? Um, all right, and then, you know, that said, it, and I don't want to spend a lot of time, although, you know, not, not that I'm um, downplaying, um, in this class, we probably won't use precision recall a lot, or the, um, the, the, um, uh, the ROC curves either, but it is good that, that you kind of, um, That, that get introduced to what they are because you'll you'll see them around right I mean precision and recall and also the RC really are, are based off of the um, confusion matrix so, so again if we restrict ourselves to thinking about the binary a, a binary classification task these these are really just summary measures um, doing some things with the true positives so precision is just true positives divided by true positives plus false positives and recall is just true positives divided by the true positives plus false negatives. So again, if, if, if you can't mem remember that, it, this figure is really helpful even to me still now. So um, um, recall was like three out of five. So, so in this case, um, our, um, our false, we had two out of, uh, so all of the, so the, our, our row here are the, the cases in this reduced data set where it was actually a five. So, so again, our actuals, the actual labels, the true, the truth um, are in the rows here. So uh, of the things when it was actually a five, recall is measuring, um, you know, three out of five, the, the true positives among the sets of all of the, the fives. So, so three times out of the fives we correctly identified a five, label it as a five, when it was a five, right? For 60% recall. And precision um, is, is kind of concentrating on this, right? So notice recall and precision kind of are, are more concerned with false negatives and false positives um, in relationship to the true positives. So, so we're, and that reflects a little bit the bi a, a bias, right? Because, um, um, usually for a binary classification task, it's this true positives that are often the most important thing. Um, so, so, you know, so think of, of a binary classification task like where we're trying to make a cancer detector in somebody, right? So, so we get image data of, of an x-ray or, or we get uh, gathered data of, a, of an exam. 
and we want to predict cancer or not cancer, right? So it, it's 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 when 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 we correctly identify that they have cancer and they truly have cancer, you know, those are the things that are most important um, often for for binary classifiers like that, and, that, and that's kind of why recall and precision are measures of the true positive in relationship to when we were mistaken in one way or the other. Um, all right. But I think as I mentioned in my um, video, you know, um, I still, for me, I still like to, to just have the full confusion matrix to, to get all of this rather, rather than just have the measure only of precision and recall. So whenever I'm reading a paper that only percent, that only, you know, gives me precision and recall and doesn't just print, print out the confusion matrix, um, you know, I kind of wonder, kind of what was happening down there, true negatives and some things like that, so. Um, but um, yeah, anyway, so you can actually, one thing to know about this, about uh, like the, either the confusion matrix or the true positive, true negative, um, precision recall scores is um, you can build a better classifier. Okay, so, so if, if, um, if it's not performing as well as you want, uh, maybe you can do things to like clean your data better or add some new features so that you can actually reduce both at the same time, your false positives and false negatives and just uh, improve both recall and precision at the same time, right? But that's not always, you know, okay, so at some point you've built the best classifier that you can. Um, and then at that case, if, if you're working with binary um, classifiers, um, you can tweak the, the, so there's really a trade off between precision and recall, which is another reason why these numbers are often kind of reported, right? So if precision for your application is more important than recall, you can change the threshold of, of what you consider to be. Um, where you make the cutoff between declaring it's the positive versus the negative case, right? And that's kind of what these curves were trying to show. Um, and and um, so, so without making your model better, um, you can favor it so that you're getting less, basically what, what you're doing when you do that is, is you're moving things from your false negatives to the false positives or vice versa when you're changing that threshold. So, or well, actually, you're moving them between all these categories. So, so you might make some things uh, come out to be correct, uh, but uh, it'll be at a trade-off of some things moving um, uh, to become false po false positives when they weren't before. So, um, anyway, yeah, I kind of want to move on. So, the ROC curve is a is a similar kind of measure. So you, you can watch the video or read about that. So. Um, all right, and then kind of finally, Um, the, the second part of our stuff for this week um, extends the basic idea to the multi-class um, classification uh, case, okay? So, you know, uh, uh, so not everything should be handled uh, or, or turned into a binary classification. So sometimes it makes more sense to, to, uh, to use the full, full multi-class um, for example, like this MNIST data, you know. So, uh, if I want to build a, a mail sorting machine, uh, it doesn't help me if I only have something that can classify fives versus not fives. I need something that can give me all ten digits, so I can read the zip codes and, and sort the mail, right? So I really will need a multi-class classifier at some point. Um,
but um, as we say here, so some, some machine learning um, algorithms that we'll look at um, can handle multiple classes kind of inherently. So you don't have to do anything special to build a multi-class classifier for those, but some can't. Um, and um, actually like the, um, the, 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 the linear, uh, uh, the logistic regressor or the SG and the SGD classifier. Um, I think that they, they aren't, they can't really do multi-class, uh, how to say like natively or kind of, um, um, uh, as a fundamental way of the, the, that the model works. Right. So although scikit-learn again, the scikit-learn is kind of, kind of high level. So it kind of hides that fact from you. So kind of going back to one of the questions that was asked here. So, so scikit-learn does do th things to, to try and keep um, your working with, you know, building machine learning models at, at a relatively high level of abstraction. And one of the things it does is for uh, doing classification, um, you don't necessarily have to realize that, uh, if, that this kind of classifier isn't inherently, can't inherently handle multi-class. Uh, versus this other classifier can do it sort of natively, right? But so things that can't do it kind of natively, you can always do multi-class classification by building multiple class, multiple individual binary classifiers. Okay, so some classifiers can only do binary classification, but then what you do then is you build, um, you know, so for the MNI. T training, you build a zero versus not zero classifier and a one versus not one classifier for all the classes that you need. And then you'll have just a final step to combine those. So normally the final step is the output you'll be getting from each of the individual classifiers you can think of as a confidence or as a probability that that individual classifier thought it was the class. And, you, and then you just pick the highest one. So the one that had the highest probability output would be your, the, the winner um, for those. So, so that's a, um, that's a, a one versus um, all classifier. Um, or another approach is a, a, a one versus one. So in that, you actually break up your data set um, and you only train it on like the zeros and the ones. So then you have a, a, a one, you know, a zero versus one classifier. And then you also build a classifier just with the zeros and two data. Um, and you have a, a zero versus two classifier, right? So if you work it out, there'll, there'll be more. So the, the, the one versus all for like the MNIST, you have to have 10 individual classifiers, right? One for each of your classes. For this one, you have to have a classifier for every pair, although not, so zero versus ones and one versus zeros is, is the same classifier, right? Um, but, but yeah, if you work it out, you end up with approximately n squared or, or n times n minus one divided by two classifiers you need, right? Um, so in that case, though, you can kind of think of that as like, um, um, so, so the way you pick the winner for the, the one versus um, one on one kind of strategy is uh, you see who won the most, right? So you, the, the if if the zero won more times uh, than any other on these head to head matches, then that becomes the winner um, for the the class that you pick. All right. Um, yeah. So um, as you can imagine, if you had to do that by hand, uh, that'd be a lot of work. So, you know, you'd have to build code to, um, uh, like if you want to do a one versus one to, to build all these almost in well, 45 separate classifiers for the MNIST case. Um, and then you'd have to build on in all the code in the framework to, to whenever you wanted to do a prediction to run all these head to head matches and then count up who had the, who was the winner in, in the most matches and, and all that kind of stuff. So, so again, scikit-learn framework is kind of doing that for you, right? So for classifiers that aren't inherently multi-class, um, it will usually default to like a, a, 
a one versus all, I, I believe, um, um, and do that. But there's ways to specify, you know, if, if you want to do one versus um, one on one versus one versus all, you can kind of use the meta parameters to do that. I talk a little bit about that in the, uh, in our textbook talks a little bit about, you know, how you do that in here. Um, um, but you know, uh, again, we probably won't come back to this. So, so for the most part, if we need to build a multi-class classifier and we're using the scikit-learn framework, we'll just let it do the right thing for us. Um, and, and in that case, if you build a multi-class classifier and do a predict, it'll give you a class label. So instead of giving you a true false label, it'll give you the predicted. So in the MNIST uh, data set, uh, it'll give you 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 9 as the predicted label. Um, all right. Okay, and then, yeah, I think I'm going to wrap up. So, you know, um, so it, you have the same kinds of issues in terms of evaluating the performance, uh, but you can always calculate accuracy. But when you're calculating accuracy, uh, you really, you know, want to also look at, at how you're doing on um, your, your incorrect predictions, right? So you, want, you don't want to look just at accuracy. Um, but you can create a confused matrix just like we did for the binary classification case. Um, so here the rows are going to be the true labels and the columns are going to be um, our predictions, right? So again, you'll expect for a good classifier that most of the stuff will be in your diagonal and your off diagonal stuff is going to be your um, misclassifications, basically. Um, but yeah, we talked a little bit about in here of, of um, how you can visualize a, a, a more complex confusion matrix like this to find, to, to get more information about how um, your classifier is working or not working in this case correctly. So. Um, yeah, and then finally, so sometimes you um, want to output, um, instead of just having a single output, you might have multiple outputs that you want to do. And then you can actually do this for the regression case as well, but um, um, sometimes it can be advantageous to build a single classifier that has multiple multi-label outputs, as our textbook calls it, right? So here what I mean is, um, hopefully you understand, so instead of having just a single output, like for the binary case, um, instead of having just a, a single output, like a five or not five, we might build a multi-label classifier where we want to have two outputs. Uh, either it's a large digit, seven, eight, or nine, um, or it's um, a, an odd digit, one, three, five, seven, or nine. Right? So those would be our, our kind of examples of our labels here. So. Um, so yeah, in this case, I don't know if this is a common distinction. Um, so our textbook says that there's a, dif a difference between multi-label versus multi-output. So it says that if, if you have multiple outputs, but all the outputs are binary classes. So in this case, we actually, these, both of these were binary. It was either not a large digit or a large digit, or it was either um, odd or not odd, right? So, so binary, true, false, both cases. So it called that multi-label versus multi-output is the most general case, right? So I, I would just call this, you know, so we got multiple outputs and the outputs were could be potentially non-binary. Um, so. All right, yeah, so with that, um, I think I'm gonna wrap up. If, there any, if there's any last minute questions, go ahead and shout them out here. Um, but um, but um, my voice is going pretty bad here, so. All right, um, yeah, I'll go ahead, I think I'll go ahead and, and end it, wrap it up. Yeah, so, so thanks for all listening. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm doing more talking than I, than I was hoping on these, so maybe I'll have to plan out a little bit more uh, what I do, although there's gonna be a lot of overlap 
with the existing videos if I do that. But uh, but yeah, we'll see. So um, um, yep, I'll see you guys then next time. Send questions by email if you have them on the assignment, uh, and I'll check. I'll check these um, these lecture notebooks here, make certain I got the right um, information in our um, in my Leo online about the names of these things and stuff. So all right, I'll see you guys later.